is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Season 2, Episode 11. Josh is the man of my dreams, right? In this episode, the Santa Anna winds are here. As a force, but also kind of a narrator, this is a real weird episode. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Megan for commissioning this episode. And also thanks to Megan for her flexibility, because I had to reschedule due to having no internet on the day that this was meant to be broadcast. Um, this episode is really, really fun. And also got weirdly emotional for me, guys. I totally started crying when Paula decided that she was going to forgive her husband and let him move back in and give him a second chance. I am really happy that's been dealt with because every episode I have been waiting for it to come up. You know, we've had um, the episode where Rebecca steps in and helps her out. And then we've had Paula take a back seat because of everything that's been going on with Rebecca and the drama behind it. As will happen. And I have been sort of like, wondering when we were going to get back around to dealing with Paula and what's going on. Um, and I just really like, I think this is the right thing to do. I am not somebody who tends to be of a forgiving mind when somebody has cheated on a spouse. If like, the circumstances are different. This is, you know, he slept with this other woman, really fucking terrible mistake, but he immediately confessed the like day, the morning after right away and clearly knew he had done fucked up. Like he was not even, <sighs> there was no flicker of an excuse coming from him is the other thing I think that really like cemented it to me that he really knew that he had made a mistake. There was no, well, if you hadn't been late, if you had made it to my show, I wouldn't have felt so bad. And I would, there are a lot of things that he could have said that while I would understand emotionally where he was coming from, it would have been the wrong time to fucking say it. And it would have sounded like him trying to rationalize why what he did wasn't that bad, but he doesn't do any of that. And when she kicks him out, he doesn't try to like argue that he has a right to be like, he seems very willing to take his licks. Uh, terrible, terrible phrase, but you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I really, really get when she's talking about her pride and other people thinking that she is a doormat, why she would feel this way. And this is something that I think a lot of people struggle with. It's not just women. I mean, men in some ways, if it gets out that their woman cheated on them, men can have it even harder because there's this just fucking cultural macho bullshit that goes along with it. And if they choose to stay with a woman who has cheated on them, it's a whole other animal. But for women, there's this sort of like modern feminist thing because we are so used to being expected to put up with cheating as just part of what it's like being married to a real man, that we have this instinctive reaction to it now, where we feel like this is just one in a list of bullshit things that we are expected to put up with. And it's a... It, it, like, I mean, even somebody like fucking Beyonce, she got cheated on and made a whole album about her struggle to when she found out coming to terms with it, moving on and deciding to trust again. And there are so many people out there who feel that 
this incredibly powerful, intelligent woman made a really big mistake deciding to hold on to her husband after all of that. And there really just comes a point where what other people think about your relationship can't be the deciding factor anymore. Now, what's tricky about that is that there will be times when everyone is saying something about your relationship and you don't believe it because you think, well, I'm the one in it and what you all say doesn't matter. And you have to be able to tell the difference between when you are willfully ignoring the well-intentioned, heartfelt, thoughtful advice of friends who want the best for you and know you. And when you are ignoring the judgments of strangers or acquaintances that don't know you well and don't know your situation, it's very easy to tell yourself what other people think about my relationship doesn't matter. When you are in the midst of something that's abusive or toxic and you don't want to see that. And it's very clear from the way that things are going with Paula, that's not what's happening here. She's talking to two of her closest friends, a best friend, even though she's not his best friend or he's not hers and that's okay. Um, these are people who know her well, who hear in her voice that she misses her husband and can tell that really she wants to take him back. And it is just her pride and her concern about other people that are, that is stopping her. It's a very different situation. So I think that's, that's something that is interesting to me because outside perspectives can be really, really valuable, but you just have to be able to make a clear and unbiased, which is almost impossible judgment call about who is giving you the advice and why they're giving you that advice. Um, also, I should mention that I find it really interesting that Rebecca does not tell Paula about what went down with Nathaniel. That's the end of the episode is Rebecca telling Paula, I know people are going to think it's too fast, but really, who cares what other people think? I can't let that rule my relationship. It's my love story. And in the moment, this is very much what Paula needs to hear. But if she knew the context of it, of why Rebecca has pushed up that fucking wedding date. You know, I'm, I don't know. I don't think at like once things have settled down between her and her husband, that it will matter, but I can't help but wonder if in the moment that little bit of in, inadvertent advice would have meant as much if she knew what was really going on with Rebecca, I feel like it maybe wouldn't have sunk in. So, all right, let's start off uh, at the beginning of this episode where we see the West Covina sign and all of these like, uh, like, I guess, leaves and just debris flying past the sign. And we go into the office and what is her, what is, is crazy Angelique's name? I always forget her actual name. I just keep, I think she goes by Angelique, but the window is open and she goes rushing over to it to close it because apparently the Santa Ana winds are coming and she says, devil winds, they ruin my eyelash extensions. So, oh my God, Erica says it's Karen. Erica, I didn't realize it was Karen. How could I have forgotten this? This is so perfect. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know how I forgot that. Rebecca, for her part, is not interested in talking about the winds. She is interested in talking about her ring. And what's so funny is that, yes, this is a family heirloom. And Josh going to buy this back from the pawn shop for her means a ton. And the whole deal. But later on, she's talking about how the ring doesn't sparkle the way that she expects it to or wants it to. And I can't help but feel like that's a real bit of symbolism. Like this ring was literally given to her by her mother. And this is what he used to propose, which is such perfect symbolism, considering what is behind the proposal and where the idea came from. 
Oh, Josh, I really, I'm hopeful that the next episode really deals with Josh looking at whether he is ready to get married because he obviously proposed feeling like this was the way to hold together a relationship that he has so much invested in. It's about pride for him too. And I can't help but think that once he's actually faced with getting married, this may be a whole different animal. Now, I'll be honest, you guys. This... I am assuming, and I may be incorrect, I am assuming Rebecca and Josh will not wind up married. But I've got to, I got to admit, I feel like maybe it would be a better story if they did and then had to deal with that, making an actual giant mistake, because that's what it would very much be for so many, many different reasons. But I just can't like, there is so much reality here. I feel like when you have reached the age that I have, I am 35. You start to see this sort of thing happen a lot more. You begin to see people rush into engagements, rush into marriages. And for me, I have never been somebody who has been in a rush. I, you know, I was with Brennan for a year and a half before he proposed. Uh, when he proposed, I think we like waited like eight months or so before we actually got married. It wasn't a full year, but it, you know, it was like a very small wedding. So it wasn't, it didn't need to be this huge deal to plan. And then when I moved here, me and Owen were together five years before he proposed. And we decided to stay engaged for two before the actual wedding so that we could save up the money. I have never been a person who for whom marriage is something I feel like I really need to get to like, and part of that might be having been married the first time and knowing that that's not really like a game changer. I think there's an expectation when people haven't I think that a lot of people believe that their relationship is going to change once they get married and maybe they will be taken more seriously maybe they will take each other more seriously I don't know there's just this sort of like vibe I get from a lot of people that I have seen rush into it that they believe this is going to have some sort of material effect and really, all it does is legally bind the two of you together and give you each some entitlement to the other's property if you don't have a prenup. And it makes it much more difficult for you to disentangle yourself from the relationship if you decide that you do want to split. Um, now, I'm not saying that marriage has no value. I'm about to get married. I totally understand wanting to be married to the person that you have decided this is the one. I get that completely. But when people want to rush into it, I feel like that cannot be their priority because they are already with the person and rushing into a, a wedding and marriage, it feels like wanting to either get it over with or proceed more quickly to like the next level, like leveling up. It's almost like people treat it like a video game and an achievement in itself. And anybody can get married. There's like, uh, especially, and this is one that I really, really cannot relate to because I have never had this sort of like pressure on me from my family, but there is such a get married, have kids. That means that you have like achieved adulthood and that you are successful and in possession of the things in life of which people are jealous or covetous. And I have never cared about that. I mean, I've never wanted to have kids. So that's always just been off the table for me. Like that's just not anything like what I judge my own life by. And to me, when I hear that somebody has gotten married and they're of a younger age, 
I don't think, oh, wow, they've really got their shit together. I have the exact opposite reaction, which is, oh, wow, they got married already? Okay. Yikes. All right. Well, I hope that works out. It's pure doubt. I do not think, wow, he got married. He has kids. Look at him. He's really doing okay. That is not it at all for me. So the impulsiveness that Rebecca is displaying here, which we know who she is. We know exactly why she's pushed. Like, even if it weren't for Nathaniel and the kiss, just the fact that she's having any doubts right now, that is enough for her to push up the wedding date by itself. Nathaniel is the perfect storm. Santa Anna wins are the perfect storm. But I firmly believe that once Paula points out to Rebecca that, and she does it unintentionally, but Paula's saying things to her like, I bet you guys are having sex all the time. I bet you get goosebumps every time he touches you. And Rebecca realizes that's not happening. I think it was going to be a matter of time before she pushed up the wedding date, because that is exactly the kind of thing that Rebecca can't stand. And it's so funny because part of what Nathaniel says to Rebecca, once he begins to propose that they should just really quickly have intercourse, he talks about how it's all about the chase that people are really into the chase. And that once you actually like get the person you are, bored by it. And the thing about that is, there is a lot of truth to it. And I think a lot of us don't really want to admit that. But I know that for myself, that can be a huge reality that I've had to very much come to terms with. Because I am not oblivious to the fact that I have left major relationships more than once for someone new. And I know that about myself that there is a danger of boredom. There is a concern for me that I am more interested in playing a role and make and like caring for myself much more when I am in a situation where I have to impress someone and then dropping off with the self care once I am not worried about whether or not this person's actually interested. And what I mean is, I will watch what I eat and work out and care about my makeup and get dressed in cuter clothing when I am in pursuit than I will when I am in a relationship. And that's just a reality that we all live with. I think most of us, once you get into a relationship and you're comfortable, your effort drops off a little bit. But I have been really trying to like keep an eye on that and continue to force myself to make an effort at least ev like every now and then because I don't want to fall into that trap again. Because newsflash, you can keep pursuing people and you will just go through this cycle over and over again. It will never be over. You will never settle down if that's what you want. And for me, I do. I want to be stable. I like having routine. I like there being a person in my life that I can count on. And I think that's part of it as well is that there's like a feeling sometimes that you can't count on people. So you just cycle them out because you are trying to get ahead of when they will inevitably let you down on their own. And you're like, well, I just won't give you the chance to do that. That's fine. So when Nathaniel talks about the chase, my immediate reaction was, oh, Nathaniel, shut the fuck up. And then it was, well, Natasha, that is kind of true for you. And then I hilariously started to be like, I don't know if that's the truth with Rebecca, though. Oh, my God. Rebecca literally moved to the other side of the country for a dude who did not have any time for her and who was like about to move in with. It is 100% about the chase for Rebecca. I don't know what I was thinking. She has been in pursuit of a dream this entire show. This has all been a theoretical, I want to get this thing that I have not had in like, it's not even like she's trying to get back something that she used to have with, like with Josh, because 
yeah, there is obviously like the history of the relationship between the two of them, but they were never serious in this way. And they were young. So the whole the stakes were entirely different. So part of me like thought about it like, oh, she's trying to get something old back. But no, this is this is on a different scale entirely. And yeah, she has gotten it. He has moved in, said he loves her, proposed all within a month. And the fact that she has gotten it all, I mean, that's, she is, she is a type A, goal-oriented, overachiever, who wants what she wants and believes that she can get it as long as she does things right. She has the control is, is the way she sees things. And the, the whole thing with Josh has been a giant challenge has been her interest in what she thinks is the prize on the hill that's going to make her happy. So inevitably when she gets it, there will be a cool down. And people even talk about this when you are, in a healthy relationship with somebody that you actually should be with, they call it post wedding blues, where you have been amping up for like a year and a half with wedding plans. And then you finally get your big day and you get all of the attention and everything for the past year and a half has been about you and your event and people doing things for you. And then it's over one day. It was all amped up for one day and then it's over and now it's just life again. And people can have a bad reaction to that. I am very, very curious if this is going to happen to me. Because I am a big planner. That's how I cope with stuff. And I worry that I will wind up in that exact same place. Because I have never, my first wedding was so small. And we didn't take a honeymoon or anything. I don't really have a good frame of reference for that. So even if Rebecca and Josh do indeed wind up getting married on this show, which I don't think will happen, but I'm kind of, I would be okay with it story-wise if it did. If they do, I could see the post-wedding thing. It's, it'll be different because she'll have only had two weeks to plan her wedding. So she won't be totally immersed in the planning for a year the way that many women are. But still, you know, she has this like idea of what it's going to be. She paid somebody all of this money in order to move their wedding date, which honestly, that was the only part of this episode, which I did not buy because the amount that you have to spend on a wedding, especially the kind of venue that she was looking at with Josh. I mean, that was, that looked like if you were going to have a hundred person wedding there, probably that place would be at least 15 grand. And what can Rebecca that's and that's just for like the venue and catering. We're not talking about any of the additional stuff. So what did Rebecca offer this woman? I mean, how what money does she have left for her wedding? I guess if she's assuming that her mother will help pay for it. But, you know, I don't know. And, and I don't know financially how Josh's parents are doing. Are they going to help pay for anything? I'm curious about what all this is going to look like. And if those details are even going to come up. Um, but I don't see anybody who's about to get married in two weeks moving their wedding date when that venue doesn't have another open spot for years. I just don't see it. So, but you know, who knows what she offered? Um, anyway, I'm all over the place here, guys, but there's just like a lot here that I wanted to talk about up top. And that's sort of how I do this show anyway. Um, because there are a lot of character things. That's what's fun. And the whole thing with Nathaniel feels like I should have seen that coming a little bit more. And Nathaniel, because he is all about the chase, I anticipate that the fact that Rebecca not only rejected him, but then moved up her wedding date. I think this is going to make him all the more determined. And I don't think it like... I don't mean determined in the way that he looks at Rebecca and says, well, now I've got to make sure that I f like get her to sleep with me before the wedding date. I feel like what it is, is he will be like, well, I guess that's over. And then the fact that she 
did not comply and is moving on with somebody else is going to rankle. And he's going to start seeing more and more things about her that interest him. And he is not going to be able to get her out of his head because that has always how it has been for me. If I am interested in somebody and they either reject me, which is rare, (laughs) or it turns out that they are like, you know, in the midst of some other relationship and now is not the time, I will grow very fixated on like getting them to at least admit that they're interested because I need that victory. You know, it can be very like a sport to me. So the fact that she kissed him, even when they had the opportunity to just walk away, that's giving him just enough of a little like opening to stick his foot in the door that's about to close. And she tells him, I moved at my wedding. That kiss was a terrible mistake. And we're just going to pretend that never happened. But he, I think it's going to, I think it's going to rankle. I think he's not going to be able to let that go. Look at him. This man is not somebody who is used to being rejected. That's not his, obviously, you know, and this is, I think is just going to be, especially considering the song that he sings, which we will get to. I think he really sees himself as out of her league a little bit. And so the fact that he got rejected by her, essentially, I don't think he's going to be able to like deal with that too well. So anyway, we start off with her showing off her ring to everybody and telling George to shut up and putting her hand on his face and saying, look how good my ring looks on somebody's face. (laughs) Um, And there's the, uh, the whole like, people in the conference room talking about like, maybe this is a little fast and yada, yada, yada. And they're just hearing about the engagement. They're not even like they don't, the the wedding hasn't been planned for two weeks out at this point. So I can't imagine what they're all going to say about that. Um, And he, when Nathaniel comes in, he says something to Rebecca about how, oh, it's your engage, you're engaged. That's why you look pretty decent today. Uh, because otherwise you look the way that librarians look in real life, (laughs) which is one of those, like, there is such an ongoing thing with the sexy librarian, like fantasy. I was going to say stereotype, but it's not even really that it's a fantasy and real librarians fucking hate that shit. Y'all just FYI, if you are like talking to somebody on Tinder or if you are like anybody that you are trying to get to know, if you find out that they are a librarian, don't make a a sexy librarian joke because they hate it. They hate it so much. They hate it so much. I know several and they are very over that and it's not funny and it's not cute and it's not flirty. It's tiresome and you are basic and boring when you do that. Um, anyway, when he says that, being engaged and shackled to one person forever is so boring. I was like, of course he would say that he thinks that he's like the playboy. And he starts talking about chasing a client. And then once I sign them, it's like quit calling me over the time all the time. Nobody likes a needy whore. And when he says that everybody gets this look on their face and he immediately goes and sits down and says, who wants to talk budgets? And I was like, what just happened, Nathaniel? buddy. What was that? Mm-hmm. Anyway. Um, so yeah, Rebecca's talking to Paula. Paula says something about how they're, they must be having sex all the time. Rebecca gets a little self-conscious about that. And then we go to Daryl trying to get Paula to talk to him about what's going on because he can be a good sounding board and he had somebody cheat on him once and he can, he knows how that can be. And, uh, she tells him that he made her feel worse and leaves him sitting there alone at the table. So then we go to the scene where she's looking up wedding venues and Josh has a, our lady of West Covina church league shirt on. And he has been volunteering with the kids playing basketball for the church. 
And it turns out that this is something that for him, the visit to her family's, uh, to the bar mitzvah reawakened his interest in spiritual stuff and made him realize that he really enjoys being around people for whom that is important and being part of that culture. And this is just one in a series of moments of me being like, Oh, these two are not compatible. I don't think anything about Josh seems pushy or obsessive over religion. There is nothing that feels like he would ever make this a problem for Rebecca. It is simply that their priorities are so different. Her, she is the one who suggested that he do this volunteering and she obviously has no problem with it, but she does tease him about it a little bit. You know, when he says, I like the spiritual stuff and she like says playing basketball because for her, Anytime somebody talks about spirituality, she immediately assumes hypocrisy or pretension or whatever. And she's treating it that way with Josh, too, even though for Josh, I think it's a genuine, you know, like he's just dipping his toes in and figuring things out. And I wonder if this is going to come up again, because they talk about the wedding venue. And I am assuming that this is going to be where they have the ceremony. But what if Josh wants to have the wedding in a church? What if there becomes like, uh, there is just a lot that I don't know yet about how the two of them interact and how they organize their respective priorities. Um, so they're about to look at this wedding venue and there is a pop-up from KPUX, a with a wind advisory for tomorrow. Now, I'm just going to say this pop up with a weatherman, that's not a thing, especially on a website where you're looking at the wedding venue, the hotel. This, no, that's not a thing. But anyway, this dude winds up being the personification of the Santa Ana winds. And this weatherman is a cute as a goddamn button. He is not my type. He's so youthful looking and he's so like, he's got very sharp features, but I will bet you any amount of money that if Rashawn listens to this episode, she will remember this weatherman and be like, oh yeah, he is fine as fuck. This dude is her type. Like, so, so very much. If he looked like a, maybe a little bit like, more threatening. I think she'd like him better. But I imagine that this guy was like really doing it for her. He has when it, like the the outfit he's wearing as well translates beautifully because he's got one of those like evening jackets on with the opposing color lapels. The jacket's this like midnight blue with black lapels and a simple black tie, but a tie pin that kind of stands out. And the whole look, honestly, is really, really excellent. And when he comes up later on in the episode, I really, I was very happy to see how they were making use of him. I thought he was delightful. And he's got a perfect face for this kind of classic, like, doo-wop song. It's, he looks like he could be on the cover of an album from, you know, 1961. Um, <laughs> Erica says this weatherman can get it, by the way. Aunt Anna Kay says he looks fine with a beard. Ooh. Interesting. Y'all know I love a good beard. I have no problem with a clean shaven man, but you add a beard to most men and it's an improvement. Not always, but mostly. And I'm interested if y'all want to link me to a photo, I would look at it. I'm just saying. Um, so, yeah, when Josh sees the venue, he agrees because he realizes that this is where they filmed the uh, the Catalina wine mixer in Step Brothers. And so he gets really excited because he loves that movie and that thinks that they should totally have their wedding there. Y'all look, I'm not trying to say if you liked the movie Step Brothers that you are an idiot. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying 
that if a dude told me that he loved the movie Step Brothers, that would be pretty much it for me. That would be a big old no for me dog. So it's amazing that this lines up because she likes the venue for her own reasons. And that's the reason that he likes it. So he decides that, yeah, let's go ahead and and do this because that is a movie that I like. It works out for them. But I'm just I don't feel like that sort of thing is going to work out forever. Um, so when they realize that they aren't going to be able to get a date there for the next two years, Josh is like, well, we're going to get, we're going to be married literally forever. What's two years wait for the wedding? That's fine. And honestly, it really is like, guys, you have no idea how fast two years will pass. It's plenty. And honestly, you will probably need most of that time if you want any vendors who are remotely popular for catering, for flowers, for DJs, for they book up crazy fast and really early. So two years is nothing. Um, ooh, Anna shared with me a link. Let's see. Oh, yeah. But honestly, I think I like him better without a beard, which is really rare for me. Oh, you know why? Shit. Because he looks exactly like my cousin Jason with the beard. Wow. Jason is fine. I will say that. He may be my cousin, but that man is a very good looking gentleman. Um, but yeah, I think I like him better without the beard, which is very, very rare for me. So, okay. She decides to put their name on the wait list, even though you can sort of see that he, that she's a little bit, I don't want to say even disappointed, but the, the wait of two years was not something that Rebecca was planning on. And she can see the logic and she's ready to go with that. But it's uh, a moment of just kind of like, oh, well, yeah, okay, I guess. And then the two of them are beginning to make out while she's sitting at her de at her computer. And she realizes that she's not getting the same sort of goosebumps that she had, like, used to get. And really eventually has to be like, Hey, I'm really sorry because she's not having the response that Josh is used to and tells him she's just in a weird place. Uh, maybe just not in the mood right now for whatever reason. And Josh, to his credit is immediate. He doesn't take it personal. He's not like, Oh, that sucks. He's like, you don't have to apologize. Also the Santa Ana winds are here and that makes everyone a little weird. And also it really fucks up my allergies. So I liked that. Um, so we see the next morning her looking out and saying devil winds. And this is where we get the weatherman who is uh, dancing between these lines of cars that are in at an absolute dead stop in traffic as he's singing, I'm the Santa Ana winds. And honestly, this is just so amazing. Like he just nails this whole performance I love the whole like weird walk that he's doing with his arms. This dude does so much with this role. That's like really strange. It's a weird, if you got brought in to like audition for this and they were like, okay, so you're going to be a weatherman and you're going to be the personification of, of winds sweeping into town, making people act weird and also kind of like an agent of chaos who enjoys fucking with people's relationships because you're a prankster and you just want to see what happens. I mean, that's gotta be a weird role to audition for. I would love to see how that went. Rashawn says that weatherman could 100% get it. I put money on it. I win my bet. Thank you, Rashawn. Um, <laughs> I won my own money. I am so proud of me. Uh, oh, Erica says some of these lyrics are taken word for word from the Santa Ana Winds Wikipedia page. I confess, Erica, I did not know that these winds were real. I thought this was a play on winds that are real, but that the name of the winds themselves were not real. I am mistaken. Who? Oh, who knew? Um, Kristen says, very Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Exactly. 
Yes. Um, it's just that the whole thing is so hilarious. You, you, there's tons of like paper flying around because trash gets picked up and shit. Like I have seen this sort of weirdness before and it is unbelievable the havoc that simple winds can wreak here in Texas. There are winds. I have never seen anything like that shit. We're very close to Oklahoma here and I guess they do go sweeping down the plane, but I was not ready for what the fuck that looks like when you live in a place with trash and you know, that people's yard furniture winds up like halfway down the fucking street. It's crazy. And uh, you will lose your trash cans. Like, duh, good, no, good luck. They're in somebody's yard. You will never see that shit again. Um, so yeah, we see some dude that's walking with his toupee, like yanked off his head. Um, this woman who's got her like uh, these, this stroller and she's like crouched over it. And her kid is in there like with a screen over them. Um, I just, I love this dude's performance. He is so fucking into it. He's so f- serious about it. So we go to the office after this long number. I bring whimsy and forest fires. Um, and the window flies open. All their papers go everywhere. Rebecca gets up to shut the window and she has this blouse on and it gets yanked open And she's got this really cute black lace bra on underneath. And I loved Karen's response is, wow, those are beauts. And Rebecca very quickly wraps it back around herself so that she can close the window, but doesn't actually fasten it. So when she turns around, she still has to close it. And you see Nathaniel give her a look. And then his eyes sort of pop open as he stares at her tits for a second. And then he realizes, oh, God, I'm staring at her tits and looks away. But the damage is done. He saw them titties in a black lace bra. And good luck, because you ain't thinking about nothing else for the rest of the goddamn day, kids. So sorry. And I just. This moment is so great because this is some shit that happens. You'll be like kind of working with somebody that you don't see in any way and something will happen. And it could be a physical thing like this, where you see them wearing something and you're like, Oh word. I did not know that was under there. Sometimes they, for me, this tends to be the thing. They'll make a really good joke. And it's just, I'll have this moment of like, fuck. That was really good. Shit. He is pretty smart. And that was really funny. Shit. And I just have this like immediate like, oh, I am so screwed now. That's the thing that always gets to me physically. That sort of thing I can sort of squelch and be like, yeah, he's very pretty. That's that's nice. But when somebody has a brain that I'm interested in, that's so much harder to find. There are pretty men all over the goddamn place. But if you are somewhat pretty and very funny, that's much rarer. And I'm just like, forget it. It's all over. So this moment when she looks at him, sees him staring and the like look he gives her and starts to fasten her shirt up and then realizes that she has goosebumps. She is agitated enough about that to go home with her handcuffs ready in a cute little like silk negligee demanding that Josh give her goosebumps. And unfortunately, he is passed the fuck out on cold medicine because he has his allergies. And she goes to bed. And as she does, we have, hey, it's me again. I'm the Santa Ana winds. And here's some magic dust to make things weird. And then, and this sparkling dust sails through the night sky under her door up over her bed up to her nose and then she has a sex dream about nathaniel and it turns out he is having the same dream where he's at this is so weird i loved it i loved it i didn't when he says to make things weird and it hits rebecca i had no idea what this meant because i'm like this bitch is already feeling weird. She's not got goosebumps. She doesn't like, what do you mean? And then I realized what they were doing. And I was like, Oh, 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 that's fun. And she's like underneath him as he's like 
you know, he's obviously inside her already. And she says, oh, Nathaniel. And he says, oh, girl who works for me. <laughs> Guys, do y'all say people's names when you're having sex with them? I've never been that type. I've never been, oh, Owen. Mm -mm. Nah, son. And he isn't a fan of it. I called him by his name the other day and he like stopped and looked at me and went, why are you calling me by my name? Like I said, okay, Owen. And he was like, he immediately gave me this look like, mm. I know that this is like a commonly like, this is a, this is a trope. Oh, she called out the wrong name in bed. I just find it so awkward and unnatural, you know? Um, anyway, so she comes to work the next day and he is really, really weird with her as he's making his coffee. And it's, there's just a huge amount of tension between the two of them. And even when he hands her the creamer and their hands touch, she gets goosebumps. It's like taking nothing right now. I really must register my disbelief that that man uses the coffee creamer in the fridge that everybody uses. That man has keto friendly, sugar free, non dairy coconut creamer. That is what that man uses, but that's fine. We needed it for this scene. So yeah, they walk away from each other and she is just so irritated at the fact that she has this chemistry with him and she goes and tells Paula who tells her you have to avoid being in any close confined spaces because that is always what happens in rom-coms and you will be fucking toast my friend so she's like no problem and avoids him in increasingly elaborate ways all day waits until everyone is out of the office before she leaves so that she can have the elevator all to herself and really thinks that she has gotten away with it but my immediate thought when I saw everybody was gone is, yeah, but that man is always the last to leave. I am 100% certain he is still in this fucking building, which it turns out he is. And he sticks his arm in, gets in the elevator with her, and then the power goes out because of the fucking winds, which are a real rascal. And so they get stuck together. And what they decide to do, because he immediately proposes, how about we just have sex? To which she's like, what? What? They decide, well, she decides, how about we just get to know each other in a platonic way? <laughs> I just love this fucking wind. You might be saying, don't do it, wind. Leave these poor people alone. But I'm a prankster. Tee -hee -hee -hee. Oh, my God. I fucking, I just, I can't, I loved this so much. I loved it so much. Whoever came up with this idea to make, like, the wind a narrator for this episode needs a raise. That is just such a good idea. Um, so they start talking, and eventually it comes out that he read all of the Harry Potter books and thinks that they're modern classics. And... When she says she's a Ravenclaw, he says, I think people who are Ravenclaws think they're Gryffindors, but don't want to seem too braggy. As a Ravenclaw. new. There is nothing braggy about being a Gryffindor. The jocks? No. That's not a, what just because Harry's a Gryffindor. That's a brag. Listen, we all love Harry and Ron and Hermione, but like, come on. No, 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 no. I do not want to be associated with Gryffindor. It's fine. If anything, if I was going to be any other house, honestly, I'd probably be more of a Slytherin. I have Hufflepuff traits, but. Honestly, no, this is nonsense. And he's an idiot. But it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. She says that he is a Slytherin to which he says, I am not ashamed of that. And I actually under I, I appreciated that as much as I give shit about being a Slytherin. It's legit. It's fine. And I really, really 
love that this little thing is what kind of becomes a link for the two of them. Because later on, when she tells him that she has like that, she's getting married in two weeks. He yells after her, have fun with the muggle. And I swear to God, the look on her face, that more than fucking anything he has said to her this whole time, that seems to be the thing that hurts. Have fun with the muggle. Guys, can I tell you something? My ex-husband never read the Harry Potter books. And I'm over here thinking about where I want to get married. Not engaged yet, granted. And then I see that this motherfucker who has never read the Harry Potter books is having his motherfucking wedding near Universal and got wedding photos taken in front of Hogwarts Castle with his new wife, even though he never read the fucking books. Even though he never read the fucking books, he has not read any of the fucking books. Now, perhaps by the time he married her, he had. To which I say, even worse! Because I tried to get him to read them so many times. So a lot of people might not understand when Harry Potter is a part of your life, why a person not having read them would be so important. I say, you don't understand. And that's okay. But you're a fool. Because it matters. Honestly, though, Rebecca, give Josh the Harry Potter books because that man would fucking eat those up. Are you kidding me? Josh would love those. You'd have to give him an audio book or something, though, that he could listen to while he was like working out because that kid is not going to sit down and read a book. <laughs> um, but anyway, this whole conversation, there's like a ton of tension and, you know, chemistry. They get really close and it's clear they're about to kiss. And all of a sudden the electricity kicks back in and they get out of there. By the way, poor George, who's n nobody knows his name or ever gets it right, basically has every chance to let them free. But because they can't remember his name, he won't do it. And the next day. I mean, Nathaniel remembers his name and greets him by name. And George is like automatically first says it's George to correct him because he misses the fact that Nathaniel got it right. And then Nathaniel says, well, you did make an impression with that elevator thing. So now I remember. And also, you're fired for real again. I wonder if this is true. I mean, in terms of the show, is George, is this his last episode? It's a pretty good last episode. If they decide to like replace him with somebody else or just have him disappear, this is a good way for him to be sent out. So I would be fine with that. But uh, damn. And George isn't even like that mad because finally somebody remembered his name and he's like, just that's all he wanted. And it's a pretty good moment. Um, so I pretty much have talked about everything with Rebecca. There's that song that he's and I'm kind of glad as much as this song is infuriating. It's a very like John Mayer esque sort of of song that he sings. Um, I really was kind of thinking to myself, this is a man obsessed with fitness. And Rebecca is not fit. I mean, that somebody like him would be very judgy about somebody like her and the choices that she makes. I mean, the two of them hanging out together and what she chooses to eat versus what he eats. That's a fucking powder keg. I would not want to be around for that. And I don't. I was like, I don't know what that looks like, though. And then this song, he makes several comments within it. And the whole tone of the song is basically, I want to have sex with you. Isn't that a bummer? How annoying is that? Can we just get this over with? Honestly, that tracks exactly for who he is and what I expected. I mean, if you guys have hung out with dudes who are very fitness focused, they can be absolutely scathing in the way that they talk about women's bodies. It's horrifying. So I was just kind of looking at this like, he might be like wanting to have sex with her. But this is not a woman that I feel like he would date. I don't see him wanting to be seen with Rebecca, honestly. 
especially amongst the kind of people that he probably has in his circles. I don't know. I I feel like this is a this is this is no good. As much as there is chemistry between the two of them and they want to fuck, I 100% do not think that this is a potential love interest for her. I don't think that would be any good. But it would be fun to watch. You know, there's a lot of stuff that like while unhealthy is entertaining. So, um and yeah, th- it's this like the music video that goes with the song is her in this like floaty dress doing this sort of modern dance with him and he is doing a lot of uh pretty like it's a it's sort of a modern slash ballroom dance and honestly they were both uh pretty good here like this feels like something that would be difficult to learn and it's a partner dance where he has to do lifts and things and that shit is tricky and yeah you know pretty good not bad anyway i've pretty much talked about that let's talk about i don't have much time left daryl and paula because Daryl really wants for their friendship to like mean something. And she offers because she's realizing that he just, he's trying to be her friend and she, he is a good guy that she needs to be more patient with him. So she offers to go to dinner with him and it's a really expensive place called like pepper and oil, something like that. Um, and it's apparently like, right near where her husband is staying at the moment. And she says something to him about how I would see this place when I drop the kids off. And I would think about how if we had a million dollars, we could eat here together. And she hints at the fact that she is missing her husband and kind of regrets things. And it's just, very clear to anybody who knows her and is friends with her that she wants Scott back. She does. So Daryl is picking up on this and says that he's going to go to the bathroom and he goes and calls Scott and has Scott come to the restaurant. And as soon as I saw Scott, I was like, Oh, Daryl, no, what did you do? Because, like, I get his impulse. I really understand doing this and and where his head was at. But it's just such a bad idea. It really is. And it's such a Daryl thing to do. It's perfectly in character for him. Like, he really is just trying to help. And he is hearing the subtext of what she's saying because he's really listening That's the other thing is that this isn't just like a casual like, yeah, let you vent and I'm not really going to like make any judgment calls about it. He hears what's really going on with her because he does actually care. So when he calls Scott, he's doing his best, but it's just such a it's such an invasion. You know, as she puts it later, it's a huge overstep. Um, And honestly... For his part, Scott should not have agreed to come, but he does. So when he sits down, I mean, Paula, she does such a good job with her acting here. Her reaction to realizing what has just transpired without her consent. Um, And Scott tells her, I've been giving you space, but I can't do this anymore. I've apologized every way I can think of. It was the biggest mistake of my life. You are the center of my whole universe. Please give me another chance. And her her expression here is one that could have gone either way. She could have engaged in this conversation. She could have been ready to listen. But she looks up and she sees Daryl peeking around the corner, giving her a thumbs up. And that just like breaks it completely. And... She asks, what did you do? You want to know what I want to know is how you could do this to me. This is my life. And he says, I wanted to help you. You're my best friend. And she says, will you stop saying that? I am not your best friend. And she has this fucking like look in her eyes as she stalks out. And I was just like, oh, angry Paula be scary. But 
later on, she sees Scott when he's dropping the kids off and she tells him, would you be interested in staying for dinner? And he's like, really? And she says, I made that chili thing you like. And also, I love you and I miss you and I want you to move back in. And I will not lie to you guys. I teared up. I like I had tears rolling down my face. I was just like, oh, you guys. She just acted the scene so, so well. I just loved it. And later on, talks to Daryl and is like, look, I'm still mad at you. Like, that was fucked up. But it does look like we are going to work things out. But also, what the fuck? Please be more respectful from now on. And then he calls her best friend again. And he says, I know I'm not yours. Please don't say it. I don't really care because you make me happy. And talks about all of the like little things that she does as a person that keep him entertained and admiring her. And it's honestly really, really sweet. And then he sings a song about how she's his best friend and he's not hers and that's okay. And eventually she says, how about you're my best male friend? And he's like very, very excited by that. He really likes that. And it's good compromise. So that's pretty much the end of the episode. Um, Oh, man. Although there's that phone call with Karen with her man from San Quentin making her decide between him and her snake Long John Slither. <sighs> Long John Slither. You know what? I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you guys very much for listening. Thank you, Megan, for commissioning this. And I'll be seeing y'all again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.